Hi, welcome to the Pursuit of Truth. Um, so on Saturday, uh, I was watching Sky News, and they were showing live protests uh, uh, in London over the George Floyd uh, death. Well, not just that. Uh, that that's what's brought it, uh, Black Lives Matter, to organise this event, but it's obviously also to do with lots of uh, racism to, to do with uh, non-white people uh, over or oh, how many years? Well, at least was it eighteen, whatever. Anyway, whenever it was, and it's been happening all this time. And it's not just that; it's the racism with getting jobs and all these other things. This is just an uh, uh, something you can easily show police brutality. But there's lots of aspects of racism. Um, and that shouldn't be forgotten because once this is sorted out and those men, if they do get found guilty of their crime and put in prison or the police department gets, you know, taken down and replaced by a different name and gets a different uh, rules of what they can and can't do, that's just one aspect. There's the whole rest of the racism and the uh, how black people and... Asian people and etc are treated by people in respected countries but what I wanted to show you is actually goes on from the last podcast I did um, about televised events and in proof of that really so there was a little bit of violence in London I saw a little bit of it um, unfortunately Sky News kept talking about it but they never actually showed well I didn't see it unless it's the bit that I saw, which was a few plastic bottles that were thrown and maybe it was a firework or a flare, I'm not sure what it was. I'm not sure who that was. The thing that they never mention is what we all know about these protest events, that there are always people who turn up who's, uh, who, whose agenda is not part of the movement. They go to any movement. They, they're like the football uh, thugs, you know, the, um, you know, the, at football matches, you get lots of crowds, but you'll get people who want to cause violence or who, you know, that they're, they're angry about other things, but they're there to protest and that's where the violence comes. Also, we know that these events often have elements of police uh, undercover within them. There's been many examples of that, especially in America with, with CIA agents being part of things. Um, so... You know, it's, it's interesting that I know this. And it can be, you know, you can study other protest movements and find examples where police have been found undercover uh, to be doing things and to be part of the, you know, in the, the protest side of things. And also we know that there are people who just want to cause violence that come to these things because this is their way to express it, to hide within a group. So we know that exists, but why do the media never talk about that? Why do they not say, well, this could be part of that that's causing this element, rather than attributing it to Black Lives Matters without actually factually knowing whether the members that are causing this violence are part of that movement or not? And also we know that human beings all have different ways of expressing themselves. So it just, it, it's just, obviously they don't mention it because they don't want to talk about, they don't want to give them an excuse, they, they're not on the side of the movement, and this is something I think Black Lives Matter should do, is that they should turn up with a megaphone, stand in front of the police, and say to them this simple message, there is only, there's two sides to this, either you're with us, or you're against us, and yes we know that Chauvin was a policeman, and you are policemen, but what he did to George Floyd, well it's beyond words, it's evil, it is, and it's wrong as a policeman. Now, either you're going to sit down on your knee with us because you believe that action is wrong and you don't believe and you want to support what we support, which is that people uh, of colour shouldn't be treated any differently, that we, there shouldn't be this police brutality in the first place, irrespective of colour, or you're going to stand there and be on the opposite side of this argument. I would like them to pose that question and see. I haven't put it very well, but you know what I'm trying to say. Because then you can you, you would show to the television world the side that other people are on. Because they are on a side. You have to pick a side in this issue. 
silence is not an issue, is not, uh, is, is not possible, and, and deferring is also not. That shows what side you're on. You're on the side of the system. You're on the side of Chavan. You're on the side of racists. Because someone's protesting against racism. That's what Black Lives Matters are doing, isn't it? Why are the police not with them? Is it because the racist was a policeman? You can't, you know, all these politicians or whatever talking about, you know, it's good, we support, but they're not there, are they? They're just saying the words. That's not enough anymore. <laughs> but anyway, what I want to show you is this broadcast uh, for like 45 minutes of it that I watched. Every few minutes, the only thing they could talk about was this little bit of violence. And if you've ever seen the protests, lots of protests have in this country, the council tax protests, lots of different movements protests, the, the um, you know, lots of them. And there's always this element of throwing bottles and, and, and setting fire to things. It's you know, pushing police. It's part of that thing, you know, it's part of the, the game, as it were, of protesting, because, I mean, really, I don't know why, sometimes they don't just, if the police don't want them to go to a certain area, why they just don't stand where they are and protest, because it doesn't matter where they are, as long as the cameras see them, and they get their voice ac across, the pushing with police actually plays into the police, and I think part of the police want to cause um, this agitation by saying, you know, like to a child, you can't go there and immediately when you say that. They want to go there, even though that space is no different from the space they were in. So I think protesters need to think outside the box when it comes to protesting, not just go to the police, push them, and then they get agitated and it causes what the police want, which is a little bit of tension so that the, the government and the media can just point at this and say, look at this thuggery and look at this and the other, you know, like they have done. Well, that's because of a statue, but I'll talk about that in a minute. But first, listen to this. I think Joshua is one of the famous faces oh, there, but we're going to you. take you live straight away to Mark White, who's in central London for us in Whitehall. Mark, what's happening where you are? A very serious escalation of disorder now in Whitehall, outside Downing Street. Metropolitan Police have just brought in mounted officers who have just mounted a charge down Whitehall uh, from the War Memorial uh, down towards the Cenotaph. Uh, you can see one of the officers has been knocked off his horse. Uh, that horse has now bolted up Whitehall. Uh, there are bottles and other objects. Just to point out, we didn't see any pictures of an officer knocked off his horse. We saw a horse running away. He's put those words in. But there was no visual image of anyone. I mean, she could have fallen off the horse. Why were horses being used against people? I mean, that is, is something that I don't like. You know, using horses to charge against people. What do you expect for that? What, what's your outcome, do you think? People are just going to stand and let themselves be run over. Being charged by horses is disgraceful against your own citizens for protesting against racism. In white. Well, Mark, what's happening where you are? A very serious escalation of disorder now in Whitehall, outside Downing Street. Metropolitan Police have just brought in mounted officers who have just mounted a charge down Whitehall uh, from the War Memorial uh, down towards the Cenotaph. Uh, you can see one of the officers has been knocked off his horse. Uh, that horse has now bolted up Whitehall. Uh, there are Bottles and other objects being thrown at the mounted officers there on Whitehall itself. Um, to the side of Whitehall in Downing Street, uh, the other police officers who were guarding the front of Downing Street have gone into full riot kit uh, and have brought their riot shields out as well. You can see, in fact, another line of public order trained officers there in full riot gear, now just mounting a charge um, or at least a fast walk down uh, Whitehall to push the crowds back. This really happened um, about 20 minutes or so ago. It started uh, to get very wet here with torrential rain and thunderstorms um, and at that point the crowd really turned. They started 
throwing bottles and other objects at the officers who were outside the front of Downing Street. Uh, they then retreated inside Downing Street uh, to be replaced by those officers in more protection who have just come out now. And of course you can see uh, the other officers here on Whitehall uh, and the, um, the officers further down still on horseback. We don't know what has happened to that mounted officer um, who clearly uh, fell off his horse. I don't know if he's been injured because I can't see that from this point of view. Um, now the protesters right at the front uh, towards those officers are really adopting a familiar pose that uh, you've seen in the US where they're getting on their knees, putting their hands up, uh, saying don't shoot and I can't breathe. But po uh, police pushing forward nonetheless determined to move them now from Whitehall. They were happy to leave them here while the protests were peaceful, but now these protests have turned violent and the police are moving in. So you can see now a, a, a really a state of uh, turmoil here in Whitehall with police trying to regain control of the situation, pushing protesters down. They have succeeded in, in pushing quite a lot of them uh, away from the front of Downing Street. Uh, other protesters are further up Whitehall as well, and there are others down towards Parliament Square who are coming up uh, to this general area. Um, those officers at the front um, are specially trained public order teams. They are kitted out, of course, with their helmets. Uh, some of them have shields. Pushing forward now, as I say, this is a very volatile and dangerous situation with horses again charging into the crowd. Senior officer, sergeant, they're actually shouting to uh, the officers to maintain their line. We'll just continue to give you that shot of the officers uh, down there, they are determined to try to push the protesters back. I would say there's probably close to uh, four or five hundred protesters in this area of Whitehall at the moment. Uh, you can see that they are pushing back towards the officers. As the officers continue to push down, they're telling us uh, to get back as well. Very dangerous scenes here, potentially, uh, for protesters and the officers uh, here in Whitehall. It had been building, I have to say, for probably the best part of an hour and a half. Uh, we noticed uh, a shift in the atmosphere. Um, it took a turn for the worse uh, with some uh, chants and pushing and shoving at the front of the crowd at Downing Street. Um, there was more officers brought in to help supp supplement those officers at the front of uh, Downing Street at the gates there. Uh, but only in the last 20 minutes or so, uh, when the officers came under attack from a hail of bottles and other objects, uh, did those specially equipped um, sorry, those specially equipped public order trained. Uh, officers come out. Now it is absolutely torrential here in Whitehall. Um, the, the heavens have opened uh, in the last 45 minutes. There's thunder and lightning uh, across here. It was actually just after the thunderstorms started that the crowd uh, started throwing those uh, bottles and other objects uh, at the police. Um, and it's uh, no let up in the rain, but clearly that's not bothering the protesters as they are continuing to stand up to the police line here. This was what um, the Metropolitan Police were very concerned about. They had been trying to mount as low key uh, policing operation as possible. Um, they know, of course, that many of these protesters are very distrustful and um, do not view the police as being a friendly face as far as they are concerned. So having an overt police presence 
is difficult uh, for these officers. They know that that could have the, the potential for exacerbating the situation and antagonizing the crowd. So that's why Metropolitan Police senior officers decided the low-key approach would be the best approach but obviously they're not going to stick with that approach while their officers are coming under attack and that's what was happening here that's why those other officers have now moved in and they've escalated the situation uh, to the point where they will clearly take no more of the violence try to push these protesters well, they're holding them here. Uh, where we are, actually, is just outside the Treasury buildings. Uh, you can probably see just the, the cenotaph uh, right there. That's where we are. Um, cenotaph itself was guarded by police officers a while ago. There's no police officers there now. They're back behind this line uh, with the protesters facing off um, against the police. Right, we're just yards from Downing Street and behind me are still the um, police mounted officers uh, ready to intervene again if they're required. I should yes, say Mark, we're just going to replay that moment now that happened there, just a few there, moments ago when the mounted police uh, charged towards the crowds in an effort to push them back and in fact one of the officers was unseated from his horse uh, and that horse dramatically uh, charging up Whitehall uh, unmanned. Let's replay that moment quickly and just show people at home uh, just how heated things were a moment ago. So this was just a few moments ago as police officers in central London were attempting to regain control of what's become uh, a pretty febrile situation on the ground at Downing Street. Uh, Mark has been there throughout. Mark, the mood changed somewhat around, what, half an hour ago? Officers now trying to get a, uh, a grip of this area and push uh, protesters back this way as well. So you can see them now facing us because they have some protesters where we are uh, right on this side of Whitehall so effectively those officers were surrounded they had protesters to their back protesters to their front so that's why this other group of police officers have now been brought in uh, to help um, guard those officers back uh, to give them that added level of protection So police officers now pushing the lines back, uh, pushing us back as well. But they're up towards uh, Downing Street. They want this group of protesters that are here away from an area where they could harm those officers. Because obviously those officers have their backs to them. They're not in a position to look out for any danger. So that's why we're seeing this operation now, just to try to clear uh, this space in Whitehall. Um, make sure those officers' backs are protected as I see another bottle going over. It's a plastic bottle. Uh, luckily, quite a few of the bottles uh, that have been thrown this evening are plastic bottles that people have had with them throughout the day. Uh, there were some glass bottles as well and uh, some other harder objects thrown at the, at the officers. Um, situation has calmed a little, but it's very, very tense here uh, as these officers face off uh, with the protesters here on Whitehall. Yeah. So, Mark, just give us a sense then of the mood. It appears a bit calmer, actually, where you are than just a few minutes ago. Do you get the sense that the police have got the situation under control now or the sense that perhaps things could get very heated very quickly again? Uh, because of uh, deterioration uh, in the situation uh, which turned violence within the last half hour. Well, if you're tuning in, uh, this is the scene live tonight outside Whitehall where protests uh, in honour of the death of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests have turned 
somewhat tense in the last little while. Uh, it was around Downing Street and indeed the Houses of Parliament for several hours this afternoon. But uh, as the heavens have opened and the weather has turned, so too it seems has the mood. Uh, in the last 15 to 20 minutes or so, we've seen mounted police having to charge towards the crowds to try and get the scene under control. And certainly something I've never seen before, uh, uh, a police horse uh, with his officer unseated charging down Whitehall past the Cenotaph. Let's bring in our Sky policing analyst, Graham Wethone. Uh, Graham, of course, this is everything uh, that uh, very senior police officers were hoping wouldn't happen today. Things having calmed down, but the mood incredibly tense. Uh, yes, it is. They've maintained a very low profile, just normal um, officers out in a normal, normal policing uniform in front of Downing Street, Whitehall. Uh, they've been there for, since about midday today, so a long time out on the street. Um, I think you heard from Mark saying it escalated very quickly. There were some bottles being thrown by the crowd. I'm, I'm pleased to see the police commanders um, today have reacted very quickly. They've obviously had officers in full protective kit ready in the surrounding streets. They've deployed those very quickly today in front of Downing Street to relieve the officers without the protective kit because they were coming under uh, some fire from some missiles being thrown. Then we saw the mounted branch doing advance. I was quite surprised not to see the foot duty officers uh, following the mounted branch up the road. Normally the tactic when you deploy a mounted branch and the horses is you have uh, officers on foot following them up the, up the road to take the ground behind them. You saw, I think, members of the crowd or the crowd almost coming in behind the horses. I think I saw one of the, the mounted branch supervisors almost turning around looking to see where their support was. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, we saw at least one horse uh, go back towards Trafalgar Square. One loose right. horse. Yeah, I mean, Graham, what's been impressive is the speed with which the police appear to have got things under control again. This is the moment we're seeing now where those mounted officers really had to, as you can see, charge towards the crowd as those missiles were being launched and try and bring things under control. They did that successfully, testament uh, to their training. But of course, things can turn very, very quickly, um, as was demonstrated there, and it's no guarantee that they'll be able to hold that line. No, as you see, the horse is going up, up towards Parliament Square. Um, and as I said, I'm quite surprised not to see some officers almost like supporting. You can see the, the officer in the centre, they almost like turn around looking. They're now being surrounded by the crowd. That's why you saw more officers on foot coming out towards them very quickly, trying to reclaim, take the ground again. There's the loose horse going back down towards, uh, past the Ministry of Defence, down towards Trafalgar Square itself. Hopefully the the rider is okay, they will be attended to by their colleagues um, and you can see the, the horses holding the line there now in, in Whitehall. So, reacted very quickly, but as I said, I'm, I was uh, pleased to see that the uh, protective officers, you can see there with their, their um, NATO helmets on, uh, full cordons in place now outside down the street, and they'll just now try and calm the situation down in Whitehall, try and regain the ground as they've done outside down the street, calm things down, put some distance between uh, the crowd where the, the um, where the violence first started and escalated from. Just try and calm things down now and try and get people to maybe disperse quietly, very slowly, uh, just take Whitehall again and, and try and restore order. And Graham, just talking about the politics of all of this, we've heard the government publicly saying, you know, please put public health first, please don't go out on the streets and protest. This is a sentiment echoed by the Home Secretary Priti Patel again this morning. Clearly that hasn't been the case. There are these guidelines, these laws in place to stop people from gathering in groups larger than six. Why aren't we seeing arrests at these protests for people who are clearly defying social distancing rules during a pandemic? I think uh, you just see the answer to that. There was, there was no uh, intervention by police. Um, the, the violence was initiated and escalated by the people outside Downing Street. So uh, the police then react to what that is. If they start going and making arrests for the breach of social distance, distancing guidelines, I think you'll see a greater level of animosity and, and a resentment and a reaction to that, which will be disorder and violence. They're trying to keep things calm and trying to police this on a very low level. They'll react to disorder and violence, as we've seen. They'll deploy their protected officers and mounted branch to calm things down, to restore order on the streets. Um, but to start going in and making an arrest of people for, for breaching and what is effectively like a minor offence at the moment, I think is the wrong thing to do. I think they've got this absolutely correct at the moment today.
Okay, Graham Weston, thanks very much. Do stand by. I'm sure we'll cross back to you if we can later on. But let's go back to Mark White, who's at uh, the scene of all of this this evening for us. Uh, Mark White, we've seen the police uh, calm things down significantly just in the last few seconds. One protester fist pumping a police officer in a, a sign of solidarity. And it does appear for the time being, doesn't it, Mark, as though things are under control much more. Well, yes, I mean, I think uh, Graham was right there in that, you know, the police are faced with, with little choice. When their officers come under attack, uh, they can't just stand there and let that happen. Um, the, crowd, the crowd escalated the situation as we speak. A player has been thrown over, which has sent some of those police horses into a little bit of a panic there, which is obviously dangerous for them. We saw... Uh, about half an hour ago, one of those officers fell from his horse, so um, that player just being uh, dealt with well, it's on the ground there at the moment, but that understandably spooked the horses, they, they do have a level of training, these horses, uh, to try to deal with uh, noises and flashes and things like that, but they're, at the end of the day, wild animals and, and they can spook uh, quite easily. And, uh, those officers did go into uh, some of the, uh, those horses were, were panicked a little by that, but calm again as the officers on horseback are pushing forward. As I was saying um, just before then, in terms of uh, what the police were faced with, there was um, certainly a, an escalation in the violence against those uh, officers, and that's why uh, as now buying uh, more bottles now being thrown towards uh, the officers uh, on horseback. Um, as I say, you know, they, they moved and they're not going to uh, leave the, the officers who were less protected uh, on the gates of Downing Street to, to face that uh, barrage of uh, bottles and other objects. And that's why the, the more heavily protected public order teams came out. Uh, and as Graham was saying, they now have gained uh, an element of control in terms of at least pushing the protesters further back from that area around Downing Street. As we speak to our right, uh, Richie, our cameraman, you can see another confrontation. Uh, the officer's trying to uh, create a line there as another bottle comes over. Um, so another bottle quite close to us there. but. Um, the, the, this is a difficult area. We're kind of uh, hemmed, we're stuck right in the middle here uh, between two, two police lines. A police line pushing people uh, further up Whitehall towards Trafalgar Square and a line pushing protesters or at least standing off against protesters uh, heading down towards Parliament Square. Uh, we're right in the middle. Uh, in a way, it's... Um, uh, it's comforting because, uh, you know, we're protected from any kind of violence potentially from protesters. However, there are uh, bottles and uh, other items that are being thrown over uh, in our direction, aimed probably at the police rather than us, but I'm sure they probably wouldn't mind if they took out a, a camera crew or two either because they certainly don't look to the, the mainstream media as, as friends. Uh, as far as many of these uh, protesters have told me, at least. Uh, That's because you're standing on the side of the police, isn't it? <laughs> you're not on the side of, like I've just shown here, how it's been reported. I will forward it on a little bit, and you can hear uh, just a few more examples of where the only thing they're talking about is the few minutes, which they never seem to repeat. The only thing they ever repeat is the horses charging. Um, but they never seem to repeat what this incident was that caused all that. Um, all I saw before that was uh, a, a few plastic bottles, maybe a, a, an empty squashed uh, Coke can, you know, the small little objects. Um, I don't think it's proportionate for plastic bottles, someone throwing plastic bottles and then horses charging at you. I mean, that's the equivalent of uh, maybe in the Middle East of you know, people throwing rocks or sticks and then uh, an, a, an army coming out with machine guns and shooting people. You know, that's not proportionate. Plastic bottles, the police should be aware that they're at a protest. 
something very bad has happened. They, the police have decided not to march with the protesters, which I saw in some countries they did. The police marched alongside and escorted them, which I think would have been a much better way of doing it. But the problem is because they're police, maybe Black Lives Matter didn't want to be marching with them because there is racism within British police as well as American police. There's lots of examples um, that can be found. So, I don't know, but that would have been much better if the police had decided to protest with them by right, escorting them to wherever they wanted to go. There probably would have been less violence. The thing is, is by them standing up against the, uh, the Black Lives Matter, it created the escalation. So I don't know whether that was intentional or, or, or not, because um, it certainly feeds into the hands of the media and the government, who have very easily, very easily come to, to talk down uh, movements and protests because they don't want, they're scared of those ki kinds of people who uh, will fight against the system and, and question it because they want to keep the system in place, they want to keep the order in place. And let's forward a few a bit more and we can hear them say the same things over and over again about those few minutes of protest, of, of, of violence. I see, there was a woman journalist who went on about it as well. So I've forwarded a few minutes now. Uh, ...in Whitehall to join those other protesters facing off against the police. So a significant number of protesters here. Uh, I would say probably a thousand at least uh, protesters on that side uh, of Whitehall, looking down towards Parliament Square where the Senate uh, is. Um, been supplemented by those uh, from Parliament Square. I don't know if there's any protesters left in Parliament Square, there may well be, but quite a few of them have now uh, headed up here to join the ranks of the others facing up against the police as they now burst into song. You can see where we are, um, we're with a group of protesters here as well, but the, the shot that you're looking at there is uh, to the side of the Ministry of Defence, um, and just a little further down that way you, you reach the, uh, the new buildings for Scotland Yard, New Scotland Yard. Uh, now looking further up uh, Whitehall here, just giving you a, a panoramic uh, 360 degree turn so you can get your bearings as to where we are. The, the shot is now looking over towards or was Downing Street, heading down past the Treasury building uh, to the main body of protesters who are now just south uh, of Downing Street uh, towards Parliament Square uh, trying, of course, or they were at least a, a few minutes ago to, to push themselves up further towards Downing Street, uh, but for the, for the time being, uh, at least a, a, a bit of a lull, which uh, certainly is welcome here. Listen, let's bring in our policing analyst, Graham Wetton. Now, we'll cross back to Mark White in due course. I'm sure we'll stay on his pictures for now. Uh, but, Graham, listen, as Mark was saying, they're a bit of a lull now. The crowd's beginning to chant, but at least they are static. But in the last half an hour, it's been quite a, a dramatic change of mood. What will be the plans now of Central Command to try and keep this peaceful and keep this calm? The key objective will be to restore some order here. Um, so they'll try and maintain their cordons that we can see. We've now we've protected officers because they're coming under, uh, they were coming under some missile attacks. We also saw a flare thrown, so I think that's why you saw the officers try and clear. Mark described it as like a sterile area almost opposite Downing Street. They were trying to clear in that pavement and pathway so their officers are as protected as possible. Um, I think they'll just literally leave the cordons in place, try and uh, sit with the crowd and try and, as they're doing, you've seen officers talking to some of the members of the, of the crowd, engaging with them, and just holding the lines where they are now, and very slowly, they'll start either easing either one side or the other, but one part at a time, just try and ease them back, either back in towards Parliament Square or out towards Trafalgar Square, but a very slow, methodical process. And they'll take their time with this, they won't rush this at all. The safety officers and trying to maintain some peace and, and peace and order, as we're seeing now, and try and keep that going as they, as they maybe move the crowd away. Uh, and the mood can change very, very quickly. And as you say, they're trying to build a rapport with protesters there uh, and show solidarity. It's absolutely key, isn't it, to try and keep that mood calm, to 
uh, ensure that the police themselves don't become targets? Yeah, absolutely. They're, 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 they'll leave them there for a bit. They'll try and almost like wait them out to a certain extent. But they, they've established some control now in Whitehall. They're very well experienced in dealing with protests right outside Downing Street, uh, up towards Parliament Square. So they're, they're used to this. They're used to working in this environment, these locations. They'll have other, other officers on standby, waiting in reserve that they need to put any more additional resources in. So they'll be slowly having a look at the whole situation, look at the whole picture, where the, where the, the numbers of crowds are and where their resources are. And they'll start moving things around with an overall plan to try and regain some control and all that and maybe move people slowly onto the pavements and try and, try and just restore normality to the area. And Graham, how key will it be for police to try and keep control given the area that they're in, the fact that they are very close to Downing Street. I don't know if the Prime Minister's there or at his weekend residence in Chequers, but, you know, the significance of their location, will that be a factor in the importance of keeping the crowd calm? Well, it normally is working in Whitehall and, and, and literally right outside Downing Street, but this is always the focus for, for uh, protests and events um, for many years. So um, I think that one's just around the corner. Um, I think that's probably Bridge Street, but just looking at it, that's off the top of my head, I think, possibly, just around by Parliament itself. But they'll literally hold their cordons in place, and as I said, very slowly, just take control of, of um, one, one area, one location at a time, but just trying to hold people in, and then very slowly, if they want to leave, they can leave, they'll disperse them slowly, but they'll let them go in, in, in smaller groups. But they'll hold them there at the moment and just try and keep some, some order to the whole area. And Graham, it's two weeks now since the death of George Floyd, over 4,000 miles away, and we've seen these protests, haven't we, spreading right around the world. This is only the second time, though, that things have turned a little bit in terms of the mood here in the UK. We saw some violence breaking out on Wednesday evening. Will the police have been drawing on those experiences on Wednesday and putting into practice different measures tonight? And will they be expecting, perhaps, for the... You see how the anchor who is obviously going to be the most scripted of the person um, and will be told uh, what to say and etc. How her only line of questioning is to do with violence. It's not to do with protests. She doesn't, you know, they don't question why, why are the police, what was the purpose of the police holding back the protest that have already walked so far? What, what is it? It's because they didn't want pictures of protests outside Downing Street, the same as the White House didn't want protests outside the White House, that's why they put that big fence up and put the military guard outside the White House, they didn't want people on the lawn next to the White House protesting, they didn't want those images, because images mean everything, they didn't want, you know, like say on Downing Street, the head of, 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 of the parliament being shown with his protests in America, so there was the is the, um, I don't know what it's called now, but it's where Abraham Lincoln's statue sits. They put police on top of those stairs so they couldn't go up because they didn't want those pictures. So that's really what was the, because the, well, otherwise, why don't the police just let them w walk with them? But yeah, like you can see, it's her only questioning is, is about violence. Uh, I'll forward it a little bit more. You can get a bit more examples. There's a few minutes more. With some uh, some peace. He's uh, shouting George Floyd's name, but very much a sense of people now starting to not be put off by the rain. Many of them are taking shelter. They've got their hoods, they've got their umbrellas. They're clearly prepared, but many of them open to having a conversation with police as opposed to what we saw a few minutes ago. Many of them are wearing their face coverings and their masks, and as you can see, not many people, if any, social distancing at all. Um, police, though, as you can see, standing their ground. They've got a few of their vans uh, holding the fort. Parliament Square has now started to drift off with people. Some people staying there, but many people heading down towards Whitehall. But really, many people defying the rain and showing how much they care about not only racism and tackling racism, but social injustice as well. Chance of uh, no justice, no peace, Black Lives Matter. Uh, George Floyd's name also being chanted as many of them walked the streets earlier today. Uh, as they walk down, they've also been to the US Embassy. Over there, they've been uh, chanting, many of them taking a knee. 
but lots of them keen to make their message heard. Some of them not speaking at all, just letting their signs do the talking. But as you can see, events like this mirrored across the nation in places like Bristol, Manchester, Cardiff. Many people also filming the police. There is, of course, fraught relationship in some communities. They might perceive that to be the case in some communities uh, with the police. But over here, they seem to just be having a conversation. Some of them trying to get through, but also some of them keen to get their message across. Police remaining defiant, um, a lot of them speaking to the protesters, but keen that not many of them cross the bridge. They have completely closed it off earlier when it was open. We saw a rush of crowd actually running back towards Parliament Square as the band came in to block it off. But lots of music being played. But there is definitely, I have to say, a change in the atmosphere as people go from protesting to uh, to something different. There is definitely a sense of um, an eeriness in the air, but on the whole, people remaining defiant and keen to spread their message. Uh, that's interesting to note, Ashna, that eeriness in the air, something Mark White was reporting just before things took a turn, just a little bit round the corner from where you are up on Whitehall, he said that for about an hour or so, he started to feel tensions were rising before violence erupted and there were clashes in a very dangerous situation between police officers and protesters there with missiles being launched, flares being thrown towards police officers. And in fact, as you can see from these pictures... Sorry, just before I let her continue, the most dangerous situation that she thinks she can talk about is the protesters versus the police and she uses the word missiles <laughs> missiles plastic bottles and maybe i don't know if there was any glass at that time i did hear one after but mostly plastic bottles a bit cardboard a lot later on there was a flare which i don't know where that came from but um missiles but uh, she doesn't think it was the most dangerous situation was when uh, horses charged at human beings uh, we're running there. Uh, the police had to act very quickly to try to regain control of the crowd there. But as you say, a different atmosphere where you are, Ashna, in Parliament Square. Yeah, there is. And absolutely, it is about that, regaining control for them. Earlier, what we saw at Parliament Square, literally a few minutes ago, um, as well, was protesters gathering around Churchill's statue on Parliament Square. And essentially, what protesters were doing was um, trying to, it seemed, antagonise the police, and the police themselves were trying to move away from them, but they kept being followed. But the, the uh, credit to the Metropolitan Police, they simply walked away from it. There's, they're trying to gain control of it, but much of them we did see walking back towards down past Millbank and into their vans and away. And once the police did leave, it appeared the atmosphere calmed down considerably. Um, so these ones that are remaining, they've simply been tasked, I guess, with keeping this bridge out of bounds. But um, there was definitely a different sense of atmosphere as soon as uh, many people clocked on to the fact that a lot of police were gathering around them in Parliament Square. Um, I guess emphasising that point, emphasising that um, that fear, that kind of uh, the questions around what they're trying to do, the misunderstanding somewhat. But people on Parliament Square have been making their way now down towards Whitehall, uh, where, as you say, things did get a little out of control. We did see earlier um, what looked like bottles being thrown, plastic bottles, um, but also it looked like smoke was coming from Whitehall, possibly a flare maybe. But as you say, the atmosphere, despite the rain, the lightning, people have really um, changed their attitudes. Although it do seem to be now, some pictures we can show you, it looks like police with helmets on moving down towards Whitehall. Uh, a few of them, as the crowd continues to move round, it looks as though uh, they're also moving with them, really keen to keep an eye on what they're going to do next. Because as you, do, as you know, with crowds like this, it's difficult to know their next move. Ashna, thank you very much. I want to bring Graham Wetton, our policing analyst, back in. Uh, Graham, it's interesting, whilst we're showing these pictures, we've got cameras in a few locations in the area. You can see a lot of people with mobile phones, mobile phones right in the faces of, of police officers. And the eyes of the world in this social media era are very much on what is happening with these protests. And the police have to be very mindful of that, that this is a the public that is quite frankly, distrustful of the police at the moment. 
I think it's I, I, I think it's only a small element, a small minority that is distrustful. And as, you, as you can see on the, on the pictures now, all the officers have got body-worn video on anyway, so they're, they're very well used to having these camera phones now almost like pushed into their face and everybody recording. You saw numerous people uh, recording the police action, so they, they know they're being watched. They know that the news cameras are there as well. Um, it's part of the briefing. They're told about it. They're, they're almost expected now on these events. So, um, but they're, they're being thoroughly professional. They know about this anyway. So, as I said before, they're just trying to restore order now, try and maintain some 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 peace to the area, um, keep the cordons in place, speak to the people, try and calm things down, restore it back to what it was before, which was a peaceful protest. It, it's escalated. It started. It seems by people throwing some bottles and things at the officers outside down the street. So the uh, command team have deployed properly kitted up officers. You can see some of the officers on the cordons now have got their, their NATO helmets on their belt so they can quickly change into their protective kit. But there's, there's obviously a willingness, a desire by the command team to put almost like a normality back into this. So we get the officers back out in their normal headgear, which isn't protected, um, try and restore a, almost like a normal policing picture to what we're seeing. That's, that's just outside, I think mean, that's Bridge Street, just outside, um, I think mean, that's St. Stephen's pub just on the right hand side there so uh, parliament on the left hand side parliament square in front of you so you can see the, the command team clearly putting cordons in place trying to keep the people where they are at the moment and just try and talk to them and calm things down again graham met police really wanted to be this to be a low-key policing event didn't they will they have considered the fact that things have kicked off a little bit certainly outside Downing Street and Whitehall. Will they consider that a failure? Will they consider that probably inevitable, given the mood of many of these protesters? I don't think I should consider it a failure of the policing operation. I think that's, that's been fine so far. It's, it, you have to react to, to what the crowd do. If the, the crowd decides to start throwing things at your offices, and you've got to react to that. They, I thought they were slow to react on Wednesday. Uh, I've, I've said that on social media. Um, but actually, they reacted very quickly this time. They got offices with their protective kit. They've replaced the offices that were in Downing Street that were coming under under fire from some bottles and, and other implements. So I don't think they'll see it as a failure of the police operation. It's probably a failure of the actual protest. This was this was again built as a peaceful protest, come along and peacefully protest uh, about the, the the whole aspect of, of what's been going on and, and everybody that everybody's get uh, angry about. Um, that happened in America. This, for me now, this is going beyond protest. This is coming into disorder and violence on the streets of London. And, and it's good to see the police reacting to it. But again, doing it professionally, trying to calm things down now. Uh, just an interesting point to make, given the fact that this is a protest taking place in the middle of a global pandemic, and we know how easily this virus can spread. Um, can you tell us why police officers aren't wearing face masks? I can only presume it's because they, they, oh, there isn't enough of them to go around or it's not it's not um, standing regulations to my knowledge at the moment for the officers to have every officer to be deployed with a face mask on. Um, I've got no other knowledge on it other than that. Either they haven't got enough to go around to, to give it to every officer deployed in the event or they just haven't had time to do it. I'm not, uh, not overly sure on why they haven't all got it, but clearly you can see from the pictures that hardly any of them have got them on. Plus the fact it may really, it, it would interfere to a certain extent and when you put your NATO helmet on and then being able to communicate with each other. Communication is a key part of policing, being able to speak to your, the, the unit under your command, from the supervisors especially, but also for the officers in communicating with the public. I mean, it's interesting, as you say, you feel that in many ways this has moved from a protest to a disorder and a violent situation and dangerous not just for the protesters, but for the police officers as well, when missiles are being thrown and horses are bolting up Whitehall, but also dangerous, as you say, if they are either not able to get hold of PPE or choosing not to because it, it stops them from being able to police effectively during something like this. It's kind of like a double whammy for officers, isn't it? To a certain extent it is, but as I keep saying, you know, from what I'm seeing on the pictures here, um, they've reacted very professionally, very swiftly um, to, to quell the disorder, the, the violence that started uh, in a number of, in, outside Downing Street, and now this, these pictures from Bridge Street, as I said, just by, just by Houses of Parliament. Um, so keep the whole, try and keep the whole area um, calm, put the cordons in place, put a number of officers out there, they're probably even more reser uh, resources being uh, either briefed or warned to come down and assist in then clearing the area if they need to. But the concern will be is where you're going to clear them to. So they'll try and actually manage any dispersal and, and do it uh, uh, very, very slowly, very methodically, but in a controlled manner. And Graham, listen, you spent decades in the police force. You've got oodles of contacts still there. 
What is the mood amongst people that you've been speaking to in terms of response or perhaps even frustration that something that's happened many, many miles away from police officers who clearly act violently, <laughs> very different from the officers that we're seeing here on the streets of London, that frustration's being turned at them, that there's been violence towards British officers for the actions of American officers. Is there some frustration about that? I, I think there's an element of frustration. I think there's also... Uh, they understand the anger. Um, the police in America deal, deal, with their, deal with people very, very differently than we do here. So um, police officers understand the, the anger. You know, having, I can't comment on the actual case itself, but having looked at it, um, I can understand why people are angry. I can understand why there is a lack of, of trust, but it's it's for the officers um, that were involved in that incident, not for these officers we're seeing on the screen. We don't police the same way over here. We don't police either members of the public or, or protests like this the same way they do in America. So there's an element of frustration by police officers. That actually, they're almost like getting the brunt of people's anger about something that happened some distance away in a different country on a different continent. Um, uh, I need to add to that because um, there is the, the, it's interesting how he can't comment about the George Floyd incident. I'm not I'm just sure why he can comment on that um, because it seems quite clear cut. But he 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 refused. He chose silence over that matter. That speaks volumes, I think. And then secondly, he talks about how it's different in America and UK when it's policing. Well, yes, we, we don't shoot so many people but there's lots of images that I've seen recently because of George Floyd of the UK police beating up uh, black individuals um, you know using fists punching like a fight not like a, you know look like a fight rather than you know police restraining someone like they're taking their anger out and we know there is systemic racism within the British police as there is in American police that's the key thing not the fact that um, we don't knee on people and restrain them in the same way or use guns and shoot them in the back like they do in America. But there is uh, an element that's very, very similar when it comes to policing in the UK and the US. Um, and I think it's failure to recognise that and failure to talk about George Floyd's uh, death and how it was conducted that uh, shows the similarity. It seems to be is been initiated by an action they have no control over whatsoever. OK, Graham, thanks very much for your analysis. Uh, let's cross to our correspondent, Ashna Hurinag, who's outside the Foreign Office for us this evening. Ashna, I'm hoping to get your pictures as well in just a moment. Just bring us up to date on things where you are. I'm not sure if you... Yes, so, uh, Ashna, I don't know if you can hear us. We're just uh, hoping see, to check in with you outside the Foreign Office. Yeah, I do, I do apologise. I do apologise if you can hear any poor sanity. These are sh live shots we're bringing you now. We're outside the Foreign Office. Um, and as you can see, the crowd here incredibly antagonised to see cameras here, any form of media. Um, what you uh, saw a few moments ago, or uh, there would be all these crowd were antagonising a lot of the police that are outside the Foreign Office. Many of them wearing, all of them in fact, wearing riot gear, riot shields, helmets, and they're all currently, the camera is currently not on them, but if I turn around and just give you an idea of what they are seeing, is very much a lot of them are keeping an eye on cameras, they're keeping an eye on the media. There has been incredibly volatile relationship with the media but we are walking away from them purely for our safety um, but many of them still gathering around the police by the foreign office um, antagonizing them um, there's lots of graffiti written on the foreign office wall and you know what this is such a shame because ultimately it is the message that's being destroyed here but there is a lot of people and I have to say it's absolutely extraordinary to see London like this the rain hasn't put them off clearly, but there is definitely uh, an energy about this, um, negative energy. And if ultimately their message is to um, stop social injustice, people will question, is this the way to do it? Antagonising the police, shouting in their faces. And when we try and film it, it's difficult for um, us to be accepted in, in, that, in that way. But further down, as you can see, that's Whitehall, full of people. You can see the blockades from the police vans, um, but very much police on edge. Um, they're clearly trained for scenarios like this, but 
when people are shouting in their faces, it's, it's difficult to keep their cool. OK, Ashna, thanks very much indeed. Let's cross back to Mark White, we who's been right at the heart of much of the violence this evening. Mark, uh, just bring us up to date on things where you are. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot calmer here now. We're getting uh, some musical numbers played for the crowd that uh, has them dancing around, uh, Where's the Love and, and a few songs like that. So it's a, yeah. uh, certainly a welcome interlude and uh, that's concentrated mind so they've taken away their attention for a while at least um, from the police officers who are still there uh, in that line across Whitehall uh, determined to stop these protesters getting any further up towards uh, Downing Street uh, so thankfully at the moment as I say the atmosphere uh, has lifted a little bit um, I wouldn't describe it as anything other than still tense um, but uh, the, the crowds not concentrating their, their eye on the police just now, uh, at least um, just chatting amongst themselves and, and, and just dancing away. Uh, very different to what it was uh, just a while ago, of course. Uh, luckily, the, um, the rain has uh, eased a little as well. Uh, it was quite uncomfortable under those uh, torrential uh, rain clouds for, for a while there. Um, uh, as I say, what, what happened effectively was that... Um, there was a, a group of police officers, probably no more than about 20, uh, a line of officers at the front of Downing Street Gate. Uh, that's one of the uh, few areas where there were visible police lines throughout uh, the last uh, few days of, of protest here, guarding clearly a, a secure building there. The rest of the time, the police were trying to maintain a, a, a low profile, as low profile as they possibly can, given that this is a, a very large protest in terms of, of numbers here. Um, but that line, because uh, you had protesters who were up against that line, um, shouting abuse towards the officers in a couple of hours or so, but nothing more than that, it was all very peaceful, um, if, if a little noisy. Um, but when it started raining, the atmosphere, it, it, it sort of turned probably, I would say, 45 minutes to an hour before that anyway. Um, but when it started raining, um, I don't know what it was that, that changed or sparked it off, but suddenly uh, bottles started being thrown and uh, other items, other objects being thrown at those police officers. Now, the officers who were on that front line uh, the gates of Downing Street uh, were not really clothed in any protective gear uh, because, again, that's just part of the calculation of the Metropolitan Police Management, and you can see why. They don't want to do anything that might antagonise or escalate the situation. So those officers were just in standard uniform outside the front gates, but what that meant, of course, was when objects were being thrown towards them, then clearly those officers were um, at risk of, of being hurt because they were not protected. Uh, so you then had uh, the public order trained officers uh, with their helmets and shields who came out to the front of Downing Street. And, and at that time, it, it, that uh, is when the, the, the crowd really turned. Uh, they were pushing and shoving and, and more items that were thrown. Uh, and very shortly after that, uh, we saw the police uh, mounted officers coming uh, down from the Trafalgar Square end of Whitehall. Uh, they lined up and it all happened very, very quickly, really within a matter of about 10 to, to 15 minutes. Uh, this situation escalated very suddenly indeed. Those officers then um, mounted uh, a, a charge um, or a slow trot really uh, down Whitehall pushing the protesters back. At one point we know uh, an officer fell off his horse. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened to him or whether he was injured, but his horse, we could see bolting uh, up Whitehall, back up towards uh, Trafalgar Square itself. OK, Mark, thanks very much. Keep an eye on things for us. We'll cross back to you in due course. But for now, I want to bring in Dr Zubeda Hacker. She is the interim director of the Runnymede Trust. They are a race equality think tank. Very good evening to you, Doctor. Just first of all, uh, just give us a sense of what these protests hoped to achieve today and whether the fact that there have been uh, uh, some violent skirmishes this evening will have undermined that message at all. Well, I think the most important 
the most important thing to remember is the reason these protests are happening, not just in London, but, but globally around the world, is because of, of the brutal murder of George Floyd. But also it's because the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic where black and ethnic minority people are disproportionately likely to die from COVID-19. And underlying all of that, underlying all of that is the message that racism kills. Underlying all of that is the fact that racism is a matter of life, of life and death. And that's why these protests are happening, because in a way, just as the murder, the brutal murder of George Floyd brought in, reminded us about the fact that racism is a matter of life and death, so has COVID-19. Now, obviously, we've had pockets of violence this evening, and, and that's been hugely unfortunate. But we have to remember that, in general, the protests have been very peaceful. And in general, um, people have been there to remind the world that life is very precarious when you're a black and ethnic minority, and to remind the world that change hasn't happened. Oh, and that, I suppose, goes some way to explain what I was going to ask you next. I mean, I've had tweets this evening whilst we've been on air broadcasting this saying, why has an incident of police brutality in another country led to violence towards our own police officers? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how long people's memories are, but it was only a few years ago when we had when we had the murder, when we had the deaths in custody murders of Edson de, Edson de Costa, of Russian Charles, we had Sean Riggs dying in deaths in custody or following police custody, we had Oliseni Lewis, we've had Mbenga dying when he was being deported from this country. I mean, we have had hundreds of black people, predominantly black people, dying in custody. This is not an issue just for the states. This is a very much an acute issue also here. And of course, we can't forget that after Stephen Lawrence, what happened, the brutal murder of Stephen Lawrence, and how that led to the McPherson report. And the McPherson report in 1999 spoke very clearly about institutional racism within the police. So we need to go back to that. And we need to think about how institutional racism has not only not been addressed within the police force, but it's actually arguably also not been addressed within any authority in this country. And what do you say to people who, who worry that social media uh, and the sort of the way we report things quite often in a very simplistic manner is contributing to what has been described by some as a sort of racial hysteria that they're overly simplifying an incredibly complex issue. For example, pointing to evidence by uh, Rutgers University that it's non-white officers killing black suspects more often than white officers. There are lots of grey areas in all of this. And there is it in danger, is it not, of perhaps being co-opted by those who want to make it something a bit more simplistic? I think, I think how you present this issue in the media, whether it's print media, TV or radio, what language you use is fundamental to how black and ethnic minority people are seen. And when you focus on law and order, and when you focus on the violence perpetrated by black people or the stereotypes, the pathological stereotypes of, criminal, of criminality, what it does is it removes the humanity from black and ethnic minority people. And this is the fundamental issue here. OK. Uh, well, listen, Dr. Zubeda Hack, uh, we have to take a, a break in just a moment, so we will leave that interview there. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I just want to sum up... Leaving that interview there because she attacked the media, isn't it? Because that's exactly what they were doing. And she said about systemic racism hasn't been sought out in any organisation that includes the media. And you can see how the media was... All they want to talk about is violence, violence, violence. 90, say 8% of the protests were peaceful, 2% were violent. What is it they concentrate on? The 2% of violence. Well, that's not factual. That's not news, is it? What is that? That's propaganda. And now, as she's just been attacked, because the, she said that, you know, you've got to be careful what verbiage, what words you use, and they've been using missiles. Uh, Donald Trump's been using the word thug and etc. Now she's going to round out what happened today and you know what's going to make it, don't you?
Yeah, thank you very much for coming on the show. I just want to summarise the scene to our viewers and let them know exactly what they're watching this evening. These are the Black Lives Matter protests that have been taking place for several hours in central London, hugely peaceful throughout the course of the afternoon. But uh, our correspondent Mark White on the ground sensed a change in the mood about an hour ago outside Downing Street with tensions really rising there between protesters and the police. And uh, for a short time, around 10 to 15 minutes or so, uh, the police appeared to lose control of the crowd as violent clashes broke out between police and protesters there. An incredibly dangerous situation there. Things under control now, but we're keeping a close eye on those protests. And I just want to point out that at no time did they ever show the, that footage of, of that event, even though they were there. I assume they were there for... Let me turn the sound off. I assume they were there for, for that incident, but they never showed it. All they showed, I saw, was one minute of a few plastic bottles and a piece of paper uh, being thrown, and then there was uh, the charge of the horses, and after that came the, the flame. There was one interview I wanted to, to play, but I don't know where it is now. Maybe it didn't video. Uh, they interviewed a guy there who... Because that's the thing as well, the media, they like to talk themselves, but, uh, and that's the problem with uh, these protests, they need to make sure they have a spokesperson to speak to the media, to, to be able to quell some of this uh, over-exaggeration. I don't know if I can find the, the actual event uh, that I wanted to play, where they talked to them, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, try to uh, avoid any sort of something taking uh, our camera they were trying to grab hold of our camera um, there's still unfortunately some hostile elements in the crowd that uh, don't want us uh, to film around here so we just move away from them at the moment um, do you want to come with us we can speak to actually one uh, protester here um, just Hi there, Th thanks very much for talking to us. I know that um, you you're quite upset and disillusioned by, by what happened here. Tell us why. We, as you can see, it's, it's turning to a party. People forgot the real reason why we're here. Definitely. They're turning into a, I don't know if you can see it, but they're just turning into a, into a party. The real message is being lost. I'm sure half the people here don't even know why they're here. They're here because everyone else is here. The meaning behind all of this, while I'm here, is more than just George Floyd. Yes. It's about hundreds of years back. Everybody here, particularly the black people here. But at this moment, it's become lost. It's become lost. People are here throwing bottles. People are here doing all sorts of things that is eventually going to tarnish while we're here. It's going to make us look like the bad people here. This ain't why we're here. We ain't here to be bad people. We're here to protest what's been happening for hundreds of years, recent years, systematic police, brutality. Get your knees off our neck. Get your knees off our neck. This is why we're here. But right now, I'm afraid it's going to be reported as us, the black people, being the violent people here. When we haven't come here for this. Earlier, I saw the, the officer got, got, got a bottle throw, thrown on him, he came off the horse. That's not us. That's not why we're here. And, and I mean, it's sad, as you say, because earlier today, thousands and thousands of people here making the, their point very peacefully, trying to get that message across. It was a great show of unity. Of course it was, because those people who, who were here with, with that have the same mind. We, we come here with the same mind. But uh, unfortunately, right now, what I'm thinking is how it's going to be reported. Violence. And they're going to look at us again. And the cycle continues. But we, the black people here, my brothers and sisters around me here, yeah, no, no, no problem. Yeah, my bro brothers and sisters around me here, we came here for a reason. And that's to show unity. But that's gone now. 
Thank you very much. A uh, very powerful statement there, and hopefully peace will descend on this area. Uh, again, one of the protesters, and he's not alone, uh, there are other protesters here, very disillusioned at what's unfolded here uh, in the last hour and a, and a bit um, with the, the violent scenes and, and still clearly uh, tension here and the potential for, for more trouble ahead. He doesn't want to see that. He feels that that detracts from the message. It was a show of unity. Uh, earlier today, I was amongst the crowd in Parliament Square. Uh, we spoke to uh, a few of the protesters who came along to that. We can hopefully uh, give you a listen to, to what they said and the reason why they decided to well, effectively break the lockdown, of course, because they've been advised not to come here by government ministers because of the, the health risks. Um, but this is what they told us earlier. I came down here because I'm, I'm looking for change. I'm looking for a difference. It's too much times that I keep on seeing it reported in the news that people are getting affected. Like, there's so much social injustice, racial injustice. I just want to, like, when we say Black Lives Matter, we're just striving for equality. That's simply all it is. I think Black Lives Matter is more important than uh, quarantine right now. There's a lot of discrimination going on in the world and it should be addressed. In America, black people are leaving their house with the fear of being killed. So if I'm leaving my house with the fear of catching coronavirus, then why would I not come out? And I know it's a risk, but at the same time, you can't be quiet. You can't let it go. I can see on Whitehall, but... So the crowd... All right, so now we're forward to the next day, which was Sunday. Today is actually Monday. Um, which was when a statue of uh, a slave trader was pulled down. I mean, the big question is, why was there a statue of a slave trader still there? Why hadn't anyone taken that down? What does that say about you talking about there's no systemic racism, but you've got a statue of a slave trader? And how many other people? This is the thing, is we keep things because they've always been there. And that's our, our, our especially with English people, British people, it's like, oh, it has to stay there, it's historic. But what if the message behind it is, is, is not of the current time or you want to be part of that time? So now this is the Minister for Crime and Policing, Kit Malthus, who uh, refuses to talk about George Floyd. We have a family overseas who we'd like to visit. But we recognise, along with everybody else, that this is a, you know, we're in the middle of a, a huge global pandemic. Um, we're just making great progress now in terms of falling numbers. Now is the critical moment for us to reinforce our advantage and make sure we avoid a second spike. And if that means this summer we have to go without an overseas holiday, then that's a sacrifice we'd be willing to make. Let me ask you about the protests while I've got you that have been going on over the last few days here in the United Kingdom, not least the fact that we heard from your colleague, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, yesterday, saying that people that uh, toppled the statue of Edward Colston and then dumped it in the water uh, should be prosecuted. Um, he was a, la a slave trader. Why was his statue still up? Well, obviously, that's a question for the for the people and mayor of Bristol. And I know you've got him on uh, coming quite soon. I know him quite well. I met him several times when I was uh, housing minister. But, you know, the way we do things in the country is by democratic process, not by mob rule. And uh, undoubtedly, in what was done to that statue, a crime was committed. Um, an investigation should be underway, and I hope the prosecutions will follow. We can't have decisions by mob. We can't have criminal damage. There has to be a democratic decision taken as to whether something like a statue stays up or not. And that's the right way to do things in this country. OK, let me put it another way. Uh, should it be retrieved from the water and put back up? Well, as I say, that's a matter for the mayor and the council in Bristol and the people of Bristol. You know, my job as policing minister is to make sure that the law is upheld. And what the law says is that what happened to that statue was criminal damage and that people should be prosecuted for that crime. We literally care. We can't have people, you know, show. I mean, obviously, it was premeditated. They showed up with ropes and tools to try and remove this thing. We can't have that kind of, you know, mob rule taking place. And, and I know that police will be examining the footage, looking at the perpetrators and taking forward a prosecution if possible. OK. But if I could press you for an answer to my question, policing minister, and that is, in your role, do you think that given that that has happened and prosecutions may well follow, we could see them on the footage, should that statue be retrieved from the water and put back where it was before, in your opinion? Not, I'll ask them, the mayor when well, he's on. I'm asking you because I've got you at the moment. Well, you're asking me a question that I, is not for me. That's a matter for the mayor and, and, uh, and the people of Bristol. 
I mean, obviously, you know, post damage. You're a British citizen, uh, to aren't you? Kind of Sorry to public interrupt. Public We're almost out of time. You are a British citizen. I'm asking you whether uh, whether an image of a slave trader should be replaced, given that it's been taken down, uh, given what uh, this chap got up to and how he traded uh, in human suffering. Well, as I've said to you before, I don't think that's the way to do things. I don't think it should have happened. But I do think that the mayor and the people of Bristol have to address what they want to happen next. And, it, it, you know, I can't, I'd love to sit in Whitehall and control the entire country and take all those, but that's not for me, that's for them. Um, having said that, a crime was committed. It should but if he not was to, have happened. Yeah. And I hope that... The... Okay. Final question. You said that you're friends with the mayor. If he rang you up and said, what should I do? What would you say to him? I'd say to him that I would urge the police, and notwithstanding the fact that they are operationally independent, to make sure that the perpetrators of that crime are apprehended and dealt with. You're not going to answer my question, are you? But it's good to talk to you. As I said, it's been too long. So, yeah, the, the, the rule is that you should use democracy. That's, that's how our country is. Um, well, that wasn't that a form of democracy. They were people, uh, and they made a decision. But what they really mean is that you should do um, what um, what you're told by the people above you, obviously politicians, which is which is then and then nothing happens because there was um, they did have a, a survey apparently about this statue to take it down, but I don't know really what happened with that. But the thing is, if you've got lots of racists and they vote to keep a, a slave trade statue. But the thing is, it's like then where, where does the government get its ideals from, its moral morals from, if if it's going to need to 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 have a statue like that? And then even worse, you will get now the mayor of Bristol, who will be one of the people who make the decision about it. Uh, he's apparently the first black mayor of Bristol, and he wants to put the statue in a museum. But first, let's hear the politicians talk about. Uh, last night's Pockets of disorder erupted early on and police had to run for cover. Actions condemned by the Prime Minister, who said people have a right to protest peacefully and while observing social distancing, but they have no right to attack the police. These demonstrations have been subverted by thuggery and they are a betrayal of the cause they purport to serve. Those responsible will be held to account. Black Lives Matter! It was disheartening too for the thousands of peaceful demonstrators who marched outside the US Embassy earlier in the day, determined that this show of solidarity is the defining image. This is not a riot. This is just a protest. Us speaking, because we haven't been able to speak for years. We've been oppressed, pushed down and pushed to the side. Do you know what I mean? I think it's important for not only myself, but the younger generation to be a part of it, have an understanding. Um, understand that there's a, a bigger picture out there of why things are happening to them. Demonstrators in Bristol also made their mark, ripping down and drowning a controversial statue of former slave trader Edward Colston, an act slammed by the Home Secretary. Well, I think that is utterly disgraceful, and that speaks to the acts of disorder, public disorder, that actually has now become a distraction from the cause in which people are actually actually protesting about. The statue of Winston Churchill also couldn't escape vandals. So this was a racist. More than 4,000 miles from the scene of George Floyd's death, the cries of injustice could be no clearer on the streets of Britain. But they may need to be louder to block out those who are tarnishing the movement. Ashna Harinag, Sky News. I heard from the policing minister within the last few moments. He said that we can't give way to mob rule. We've heard from the Home Secretary as well. She says that those who brought the statue down should be prosecuted. Let's hear from the Mayor of Bristol. Um, Marvin Rees is standing by for us. Mr Rees, a very good morning. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Uh, I'm sure that lots of our viewers, when they see the image of that statue being pulled down by ropes, rolled to the edge of the water and then lobbed in, will have very uh, strong views. What were your views when you saw that happening? Well, as I've uh, been sharing, I, I clearly, as an elected politician, cannot condone uh, criminal damage. And I've been very clear throughout that I'm very 
be concerned about mass gatherings um, in the middle of a, a, a pandemic. Uh, and I've been making those uh, views known. Uh, but I can't pretend as the son of a uh, Jamaican uh, migrant uh, myself that, um, that the, the, the presence of that statue to a slave trader in the middle of the city was anything other than a personal affront to me and people like me. Why was it not taken down before now then, sir? Well, that's a good this, that's a good question. It's been uh, debated for a very long time, but there's a couple of bits of uh, world reality that we we have to grapple with. One is uh, when I came in in the middle of uh, uh, Brexit, in the middle of uh, austerity, uh, with a horrific financial situation, the pathway to race equality was not necessarily in taking down that statue. It wasn't the top of my list of priorities. Um, and secondly, I'm Europe's first directly elected black mayor, apparently. Uh, if I turn up after, you know, hundreds of years of political rule and I suddenly start taking down those symbols in the middle of Brexit, you know, you'd be you'd be writing a whole different kind of story about what that, that this year means. So my job was to get on with the business of housing, uh, domestic violence, child hunger, poverty, joblessness and all those other things I've been uh, getting on with. As for the administrations that went before me, you'd have to ask them that question. Mm, I'm sure many of your um, people who voted you in would uh, have applauded you for doing that. I suppose it then leads us to the next question, which is, will you retrieve it from the water and put it back from whence it came? Yeah, that's a throwaway line, but that would take an hour long discussion to get in about being applauded by many people who applauded me. Um, look, it, you know, we've got other priorities at the moment. We will get the uh, statue out, um, but we still have an £80 million hole in our budget as a result of COVID and government not adequately funding us that we have to uh, grapple with. And we're still doing that uh, today. And if we don't deal with that, we will have compounding inequalities in our country that will impact on through uh, the, the structures of class and, and racism. So we'll be working that. But we will get the statue back and it will highly likely end, end up in, in one of our museums. Uh, but actually, what's happened to this statue is now part of, you know, the city's history and is part of that statue's uh, story, just like the riots of 1831 uh, in, in Bristol were and the, the suffragette movements in, in the city were when people uh, spoke up. And this is, is, in many ways, you know, part of Bristol's culture to be rebellious and so forth. So I'm not, but I'm, I, you know, but at no way am I, as a political leader, condoning uh, criminal damage. And I am emphasising that those people who participated in the gathering yesterday should now be social isolating to minimise the potential uh, of a second wave of COVID in Bristol. Want to come on to that in just a second. Let me just finish with the statue, if I may. There's no rush then to retrieve it. I'm just saying it's not top of my list of priorities at the moment. Uh, you know, as the resources become available, we will get it out and we, and we must get it out because it is, it is part, is, you know, a, a one of the factors within uh, Bristol's history. Um, but, and and we're, looking at, we're looking at that right now, how we do that. Okay, and it may well find itself in a museum uh, as part of the story of, of what happened last night. Well, it will be damaged. Um, uh, it's obviously uh, damaged and, and uh, yeah, we need to, uh, to keep that statue uh, because it does tell us something about okay. who we are, as statues do. Yeah, mob rule is what we heard from the policing minister. Um, prosecutions must happen according to the home secretary you agree i i you know i don't think i don't think that's a very helpful way to describe it and i think the the, the home secretary is showing uh, you know a, a lack of understanding of, of where the country is right now um, and i would love to hear some outrage about the 25 percent of kids in my poverty in the city who live in poverty the, the growing inequality the deaths in custody both here in the united states the militarization of uh, u.s streets the, the windrush scandal uh, you know, you can't be selective on your outrage, uh, you know, and, and actually if, if over the last few years our politics had, had managed to capture the spirit of the country, had recognised that growing frustration, I think that was on show during Brexit, you know, as well, then maybe we wouldn't have ended up in this situation. We'd have had a valve, a political valve to capture those those fears, uh, you know, and almost the desperation of our politics. So that's not to condone what's going on. But, but unless you seek to understand, you, you end up in a bad situation. I think you see you see the ultimate example of that in the United States with a president who is not even trying to understand, who just wants to go to dominate. That's not the way that we want to do politics in Britain. You must understand your population. So the home, just to clarify, the Home Secretary is out of step with the struggle that black people face in the United Kingdom? Yeah. Tell me more. Well, I think, I think that's pretty straightforward. I don't think the government has really understood the struggles of, 
of, uh, of people on lower incomes, on people on ordinary incomes for some time. I am one of those, uh, the child of a single white mother. I grew up on, on benefits um, in the city, struggled my way out of school. I, you know, it's been a long time since I've felt that a government really had a handle on, on, on that. I mean, coming up with jingoistic phrases about be proud of yourself and all that doesn't feed people. And, and if they did have an understanding, what they'd be doing right now is investing in local government, uh, taking seriously issue of poverty, uh, you know, and understand, you know, just genuinely having that understanding. And it's at the moment, it's not there. It feels like it's in another world. It's in a Westminster white wall bubble up there, having conversations, coming up with statements that don't have any bearing on the struggles of ordinary people um, out in the real world. Um, sadly, we're out of time, Mr. Mayor, but I uh, would really love to talk to you. The bit at the end said at volumes, actually, and that's a truthful statement. But it, uh, my problem I do have is that it seems once people become part of the system, become MPs uh, or, or whatever to do with the system, they then lose their, their themselves a little bit. Like Pretty Patel, how is she defending the statue of a slave trader? You would have thought that she would be against slave traders. I'm sure if there's any modern slave traders, she would talk about them. Then why would you want to keep a statue of one? Why would you... I mean, the thing is, is when this happened in Iraq, when the statue of Saddam Hussein was pulled down, I didn't hear any cries like this, that, oh, those people that pulled the statue of Saddam Hussein down should be prosecuted by anyone around the world. <laughs> You see how hypocritical people are in power because it's somewhere else. It's because it's you know they they don't they didn't like Saddam Hussein, um, so therefore it was okay to do that, and they applauded it. When people were rioting in the, in the Arab Springs, it was applauded by the West as a, a show of um, of trying to attain democracy and get rid of uh, non-democracy. <laughs> but any of these struggles, you know, that's why. The media never, you know, we'll always talk about the 2% of violence, arrests, but, but no struggle. You know, if you look at South Africa, the apartheid, 27 years, 26 or more than that, of, of years of, of struggle, of, of, of protest, which were a lot were violent. Because that's part of it. Because humans are, ha get angry when they're being oppressed. And what do you want them to do? To sit in a cage and not do nothing about it? Yes, that's what they want. That's what they want. That's why they try to scare you with COVID-19 in this country. Stay indoors. Don't protest. Because they want law and order. They want order. They want control. They don't care. If everyone said they didn't want the statue, they'd still keep the statue. They'd make up some excuse about it like they were. It's indefensible. He's a slave trader. What was he doing there still? And they talk about money, money. It cost nothing to pull that statue down. You could have got volunteers to do like they just did. It cost nothing. So that's a, a, a false argument to try and defer from the real argument. And obviously he's in a difficult position because you, at least you, with him you could hear the mayor, you know, he was impassioned by the struggle of, of, of uh, people who are poor, people who are black, ethnic minorities, and etc. But then he's got, because he's an MP, he has to say those things of like, oh, well, we have to put it back, and those people have to be blah, 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 blah. But at least he stood up when he, t asked, uh, when he was asked about Pretty Patel and said straight away yes. He answered the questions, he didn't defer them. That's more people we need like that that are willing to speak up truthfully and not just worry about the system and protecting the system and being part of that system and acting in the same way as other people within the system do. Anyway, I think I've waffled on long enough. Take care, take it easy, God bless and peace.